She's new to the capital city of Texas. She also happens to be the first woman rabbi in Austin. To meet and enjoy our conversation with Elizabeth Dunsker, join us on this edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. Austin Faith Dialogue, at the crossroads of religion and life, a series highlighting the cultural and social interactions between the worshiping and religious communities in and around the capital city. Austin Faith Dialogue is brought to you by the Austin Metropolitan Ministries in cooperation with KXAN. Join us now in Austin Faith Dialogue. Welcome to Austin Faith Dialogue. I'm Richard Thompson of Austin Metropolitan Ministries welcoming you back. And today we're just delighted to have with us uh, someone who is relatively new to our city and also represents a historic first in our community, and that is being the first woman rabbi in a local congregation. We have with us Elizabeth Dunsker, and we welcome you, Elizabeth. Thank you. As you are now serving as a rabbi in uh, Temple Beth Israel, mm -hmm. uh, and as you're a part of that congregation, you've been here for how long now? Just a year, uh -huh. almost exactly a year. And you came here from? From New York, from school. Okay. And, um, I mean, why Austin of all places? Because that's where they offered me a position. <laughs> I, um, I applied all over the country. Really? Yeah. I applied everywhere. Um, I was looking for a senior rabbi who would be a good mentor for me. Uh -huh. and, um, and I found that in Rabbi Fulberg. Who is the, rabbi Stephen Fulberg. Mm -hmm, who is the senior rabbi at Beth Israel. Okay. And, um, yeah, I chose, I chose the congregation primarily because it was metropolitan and because of the senior rabbi. Yeah. And it's a growing area as far as not only the city as a whole, but particularly the Jewish community. Yeah, the Jewish community is growing very quickly here. Yeah, give us a little bit of a sense of how much it is growing. Well, six years ago when Rabbi Fulberg got here, our congregation was about 400 families, mm -hmm. and we're now at about 750 families six wow. years later. Yeah. So that's, it's, and, and it had been at that 300, 400 families level for many, many, many years. And mm -hmm. so in the last six years or so, it's really, the temple's doubled. Yeah, how do you account for such a rapid growth? Um, a lot of it is demographics, um, that Jews just moving into Austin. Um, a lot of it is Rabbi Fulberg. Um, really? He's, he's a very dynamic rabbi. He's created all kinds of programs in the community that weren't there before. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to look at the, uh, at the statistics and we found that it had doubled again in the year that you were here, we could say maybe it was your leadership. <laughs> we could. I don't know if it would be true or not. <laughs> we could say that. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that uh, folks are glad to have you here as well as you're being glad to be here. Yeah, it's been, the congregation has been very warm and has been, um, it's been a great congregation for me to be a part mm -hmm. of. Well, I'm going to ask you the question that I suspect you've had asked more than any other. But we'll get that out of the way okay. first because uh, my guess is that as folks are looking in here and they say a woman rabbi, mm -hmm. not a common thing in the p public perception, mm -hmm but I guess not so unusual now in, in right. Judaism. not so unusual at all. Yeah, tell us about uh, just how you fit into that constellation of clergy. Well, my, uh, my graduate, my, or, the class that I was ordained with, we were 50% women, and every class behind mine is also 50% women. Really? So it is, in the reform movement at any rate, it's becoming more and more common. Um, and there have been women rabbis for the last 25 years. 25 years ago, Sally Prezan was the first ordained woman rabbi out of my movement in my, my alma mater, uh, Hebrew Union College. And she has a pulpit in upstate New York. Okay. So uh, she was the pioneer. She was. You yeah. talk about pioneer women. And yeah. She was. She, Sally Prezan was it for, for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, you, you said Hebrew Union Hebrew College? Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. Which is in New York. Uh, there's four campuses. The main campus is in Cincinnati. There's also one in New York, one in Los Angeles, and one in Israel. We all attend our first year in the Israel at, in Jerusalem at the oh, Israel Oh, is campus. that right? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Okay, so, um, you're, uh, but you're new to, the, to Austin in terms of, of there had never been a, a woman rabbi here before. Right. No, there, there has, there are, there is a woman rabbi or two in Dallas and one or two in Houston. Mm -hmm. um, so there have been women in the area, just not in Austin. But a lot, there's only two congregations here with rabbis. So, 
and our congregation suddenly got large enough to need an assistant. So I it's see. not. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't a matter of specifically not hiring women. It was a matter of there not being jobs here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got oh, across the nation. How many would you say are, are about? Women? I would say about five or six hundred women rabbis out there. All right. Okay, now um, for again anyone who's looking in is wondering about the what we would maybe call the denominations mm -hmm. within Judaism. Mm -hmm. You're you're part of uh, Congregation Beth Israel, right? Which is a reform. Reform congregation, yes. Okay, and then you've got a Agudis a, Agudis Achim, which is a conservative synagogue. Okay, and there are a variety of little groups. We call them Havarot. Um, that are, there's a couple of Orthodox Chavarot um, in town. There is a Reconstructionist Chavara um, in town. And um, well, I guess that, that's everybody. There's, okay. a, there's a little group of everybody here. And at the university you have uh, at, Well, there's Hillel. Hillel, which is a national organization. Um, and there, there is a Reform rabbi who's the senior rabbi, and there's also an Orthodox rabbi there. Mm -hmm. Okay, now uh, just pull off a little miracle for us here in okay. a, a minute or two. Tell us the difference between all of these groups. The difference between the uh, Orthodox is the furthest on the right. Um, they are the most traditional as far as their practices and beliefs. Ideolo ideologically, they believe that you should do everything and then learn why you're doing it. Conserv well, Reform Judaism broke away from Orthodox Judaism in Germany in the 1800s. Um, switched the ideology on its head and said, no, learn about everything first. You should be a knowledgeable and studious Jew. And once you learn and understand why you do the things you do, then you do them. Mm -hmm. Conservative Judaism broke away from Reform Judaism, I want to say in the 30s, but I, I could be wrong about that. Um, in this century, the 1930s? Yes, yeah, in the okay. 1900s in New York, um, broke away from, uh, maybe not New York, but it was part of the rabbinical school, part of the Reform rabbinical school, a bunch of students decided that the reform movement had gone too far to the left and, and they, weren't unco they were uncomfortable in it and so they created the conservative movement which was in response to that and it, is, it falls ideologically somewhere between orthodox and conservative. They are still liberal modern Jews um, but they, their sense of authority is that the authority comes from the rabbis rather than an individual which is the way reform Judaism believes. Mm -hmm. Reconstructionist Judaism about 50 years ago broke away from conservative Judaism um, it was started by Mordecai Kaplan, who was a professor at the conservative uh, uh, rabbinical school. And um, he had other ideas about God and about chosenness. And um, so he broke away and created, mm. uh, well, the, he didn't really break away, but the Reconstructionist movement was founded around his oh, work. I see. Okay. So uh, this is uh, getting closer to our own time. Mm -hmm. And um, what uh, it sounds like is there been sort of a little pendulum swing over the years. Sure. Well, it always there always is. I mean, even to talk about Orthodox Judaism as being one entity is is really not the right, not correct. Uh, Orthodox Judaism, with just to say Orthodox, there are there is right wing and left wing within that as well, and one doesn't necessarily look or act or practice like the mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been a fair amount in the papers recently about mm -hmm. um, positions taken by Orthodox some of the, those folks in Israel, mm -hmm. right. as well as some in the States. It, I think in the second half of the show, let's come back and talk sure. about that. Sure, sure. But I'd like to not get too far from the Austin scene at this point and have, us, have you tell us a little bit about uh, the, I think you told me before the show that uh, Temple Beth Israel was the oldest of the Jewish bodies in town. Right. How, how long ago was that? This year, it turned 120 years old. Um, it's a, it has a historical marker for the congregation itself here in town. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know all that much about its founding, about um, the reasons for it, but I suspect it was there was a group of Jews here, so they got together and created a congregation. Okay. And um, then when did uh, Gudis Akim come on the scene? Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not sure what, I don't know exactly how old they are, but I know that, um, that Lyndon Johnson dedicated their, um, their synagogue, the building itself, um, right after Kennedy was assassinated, because in fact he was scheduled to come that weekend. Oh, right, um, 1963. Yeah, but, right. but the congregation I think was around before that, but that was when their building was built. Okay, and um, I think that uh, the other thing that we've noted in the papers recently is that you took a vote at mm -hmm. your church, yes, or your, your congregation, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that you've uh, decided to move. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that. We have a terrible space problem in our building. 
Um, we have out, we outgrew our building about two years ago. We have children popping out of every doorway. We use the bride and groom's dressing room as classrooms. We have six portable classrooms in the backyard. The city won't let us put in anymore. We have 50 new students coming next year. We're not we're turning the stage into three different classrooms. Mm. We are absolutely busting at the seams. Um, there's something going on every night in the building, and it's always a fight for space between meetings and other kinds of things. So, about about five or six years ago, they started looking into what ways we could um, enlarge our, con our building or to move. Uh, the, Dells, um, the Dells bought this chunk of land, the heart. Michael Dell. Michael and Susan Dell bought this mm -hmm. chunk of land with the specific purpose to put Jewish buildings up there. So that, that gave us an option that we didn't have before. So we developed a plan to enlarge our building and we developed a plan to move to the Dell campus. Um, and this has been in process for several years and we're in an emergency situation because we're out of space and mm. so we took a vote two weeks ago mm. about specifically with the plan to move to the campus the vote was whether the congregation had to vote whether or not they wanted to move to the Dell campus with the plans that we presented and it was an overwhelming majority that voted in favor of moving it was mm. a two to one vote um, that voted in favor of the move so, okay. Yeah, it's a real exciting thing that we do. The Dell campus, where is that now? It's on Hart Lane in Northwest Hills. Mm -hmm. um, it was a ranch that they, that they bought. I see. Now that's also, I understand, where the uh, Jewish Community Center is. Right. The Jewish, the Jewish Federation and the Jewish Community Center will be building up there as well. They had a groundbreaking um, in December for that building, although nothing's really been done since the groundbreaking. Mm. <laughs> they're, they're a little stuck. <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you're growing so fast, they better start hurrying, wouldn't yeah. you say? <laughs> yeah, it's time. <laughs> and, uh, and isn't uh, the possibility open to uh, the synagogue to yeah. make us move up there yeah, at some Yeah, there is, there is a plot of land that, um, that Agudas could take if they wanted. Um, they are they, they just finished paying off in addition to their building. So they're, as far as space goes, they'll outgrow their building in about five years while we outgrew ours two years ago. So mm -hmm. they do not have the emergency situation we had um, as far as deciding what to do. They have the luxury of kind of really thinking about, I mean, although we really thought about it too, what's, what's the best move for their congregation? And so they haven't been as rushed to make a decision. But, but um, I think that the Dells are looking for a decision fairly soon on whether or not they will be moving up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the idea is that this would help the Jewish community have a center in more than just uh, the Jewish community center, sort of, I mean, a, right. a broader would, kind of. Right. It would be a cultural center for all Jewish activities in the city. Um, there would be, there's a, a day camp that'll be out there in the summers. Um, the Jewish community center will be primarily athletics and Jewish team sports and that kind of thing. The federation, the Jewish federation, is an umbrella organization, a non-denominational Jewish umbrella organization that does all kinds of other stuff. Um, and then we'll, we'll be up there and perhaps also Agudas, which is the only other congregation with a building and a rabbi in town. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that we're, some of us who are just in the community otherwise would look forward to coming and visiting. Well, thank you. But you need to get something started. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, you know, we've taken the vote, which is our first step, and we need to now raise the money to build the building. Okay. Well, our next step is to take a pause here okay. and invite uh, our viewers to just stay tuned and we'll be back in just a moment on the second half of Boston Faith Dialogue today.
Welcome back to Austin Faith Dialogue, where today our subject is uh, a person, uh, and that is Elizabeth Dunsker, who is a rabbi at uh, Temple Beth Israel, the first woman rabbi in Austin, and one year she's been here, and we're continuing that conversation from the first half, Elizabeth. Uh, and I didn't ask you then, you know, what led you to become a rabbi, uh -huh. how, how you heard the call. And um, I don't use that kind of language, I guess. It's, okay. it's, um, I don't really know what that means, so I don't really use that kind okay. of language. But uh, I grew up in the Reform Movement, real active in our congregation, mm -hmm. with a rabbi who didn't take me seriously and who I didn't get along with. Um, and I was real involved in youth group and in religious school, and I loved it. I loved what I did there. I started Hebrew a year early. I begged and pleaded to start Hebrew in third grade instead of fourth wow. grade. I was always really interested in it, um, but I was, I was a smart mouth kid. <laughs> and, I see. and so the rabbi didn't take me seriously, and um, he and I just really didn't get along. I went, I was real involved in youth group, as I said, and I went to a youth group camp for a week. Um, and I met a woman rabbi who was the first woman rabbi I met, and she, she took us seriously. She took me seriously. Mm -hmm. um, she took my questions seriously, and she blew me away. She, uh, she was the most, first of all, the most intelligent woman I'd ever met. But um, really, we talked about God. We had a workshop on God, and I had never had the conversation about God. I love that someone brought it up. Um, and I love that she didn't downplay anything that any, you know, we were kids, we are high school kids. She didn't downplay mm -hmm, anything that 16-year-olds mm -hmm. not those kids had to say. And um, it, seemed, it seemed like something I wanted to do. It seemed like the right thing. It combined the things that I was best at. I always liked speaking publicly. I always, I liked being on stage. Um, I had thought about social work. And I liked being in the Jewish community. So... Um, at that time, what I knew was I needed to learn more, and I knew that I wanted to learn more, that it was like the learning process was really mm -hmm. exciting to me. So um, I went to college knowing that I was going to go on to rabbinical school, and, um, and that's just what I did. I went, I went through college, <laughs> and I went directly into rabbinical school after, after college. Mm -hmm. Where did you go to college? Simmons College in Boston. Okay. It's a small all-women's school. I see. So you, uh, you continued to... Uh, feel drawn mm -hmm. to this line yeah. of work and you've been ordained we, we was we don't you you wouldn't use the word ordained but yes we do we you do, do. Okay. i was ordained i was ordained a year ago all right good and uh you feel after a year it was the right choice oh it was absolutely the right choice uh -huh. there, there's no doubt in my mind that this was the right choice for me yeah well i uh, i think that's can be an inspiration to anyone who's looking in that feels when people don't take them seriously mm -hmm for whatever reason or whatever age. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, as you were talking about it, it occurred to me that one of the, probably the gifts that you bring to your ministry is mm -hmm. to take others seriously. Mm -hmm. Except I would call it a rabbinate. A rabbinate, okay. <laughs> right. I'm gonna get this terminology straight before the show is over, I hope. But, uh, and. Um, well, I, I specifically, I mean, mostly what I do, well, about 60% of what I do is work with kids, with 13-year-olds uh, and over. Uh -huh. um, and that's, it's my strength. I mean, my strength really is working with kids and with teenagers. I know how important it was to me to have someone pay attention to me Jewishly and mm -hmm. to organize, to have Jewish activities, to have a place to be in the Jewish community. I mean, I grew up in Rochester, New York, where there was a much larger Jewish community than there is here. These kids all go to school where there's, no, there's like the only or one of two or three Jews in their school. So it's real important that they have a place where they can just be themselves and can be real comfortable and they don't have to explain themselves all the time. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's go back to one thing we just touched on briefly in the first mm -hmm. half. <clears throat> and that is relationships within Judaism and the fact that there was so much publicity. I, I remember uh, this editorial in the New York Times mm -hmm. about schism within Judaism. Mm -hmm. It was a question mark of whether what the Orthodox did both in Israel, mm -hmm. a certain, at least a certain group of the Orthodox, <clears throat> who said the Reform and Conservative uh, were not really... No, that's not what they said in Israel. They said... It's, it's very complicated. Okay, it's, it's real. That. Yeah, it's real complicated. In Israel, there has always been a policy, not a legal written policy, but sort of an unknown about understood policy that... Um, the Orthodox rabbinate within Israel were the only ones who can legally do marriages, divorces, brises, which is uh, ritual circumcision, 
um, and conversions. Lately, this, and it's political, it really has very little to do with religion. Okay. It has to do with politics. Lately, there is a growing number of Israelis, born Israelis, not just Americans who have moved to Israel, born Israelis who are becoming part of reform and conservative uh, temples and synagogues in Israel, although okay. they have different names in Israel. Mm -hmm. But it's basically the same, the same thing. Um, that's new. That has an, it used in real recent history, like 10 years ago, if you were an Israeli, you were either extremely religious, they call them dati, mm -hmm. or you were secular, um, which means you're Jewish because you live in Israel, you speak Hebrew, you know the Bible because that's what you learned as, he as history in school, and you fight in the Jewish army, so you're, so you're Jewish. Okay. But you didn't have, but as far as religious practice, that didn't really matter. Recently, more and more Israeli-born Jews um, are becoming are becoming parts of, there's reform congregations and conservative congregations that are springing up in Israel that never were there before. Okay. So, and there's more and more conservative and reform rabbis in Israel. We have, my uh, Hebrew Union College has a program to ordain uh, rabbis specifically in Israel who will be Israeli rabbis um, within the state of Israel rather than American rabbis. Okay. Um, so the government got scared in Israel. And so what they have done is push through, it's, there's several things going on. There's that going on. The other thing that's going on is women pushing for more and more rights religiously within Israel and at the Western Wall specifically. Mm -hmm. um, the right to pray at the Western Wall, which has been denied them over and over again. Um, so there's a lot of liberal movements going on that scared them. So they pushed this bill through that passed it, several and levels. And by them, you mean? The Orthodox establishment within Israel. All right. Um, and again, that has many different tiers and levels, and it's not, it, it, mm -hmm. it can't be characterized as one group. Um, but so they pushed this bill through, which says, which makes it officially legal that reform and conservative rabbis may not perform legal conversions within the state of Israel right. only. It has <clears> nothing to do with outside the state of Israel, but it opens the door to saying that then people who were converted by Reform and Conservative rabbis outside of Israel, maybe right. those people aren't really Jewish. But mm -hmm. right now, all that it says is within the state of Israel, Reform and Conservative rabbis cannot perform legal mm -hmm. conversions. Um, what then happened in the United States is this very fringe, very small right-wing Orthodox group got a lot of press when they publicly came out and said, well, we, in support of that, we want to say that uh, Reform and Conservative Jews are not really Jews. And we're saying that in an attempt so that they'll understand that they're not really Jews and they'll become Orthodox. Mm. Um, it's a delusional idea that mm -hmm. by telling us we're not something, we'll want to be like them. Um, but then what happened about two weeks later is the more mainstream Orthodox organizations also took out, a, which got significantly less press, took out a full page ad in the, in the New York Times that said, we we oppose what this other group has said while we have ideological differences with reforming conservative Jews of course they're Jewish we take no issue with their with their Jewish mm -hmm. legitimacy mm -hmm. um, so which was which was a great thing to come you know and even within uh, in Austin uh, though there's one Orthodox rabbi here in Austin who when that when the first issue came out called us immediately and said you have to understand this is not what most of us think okay so um, the reaction in the, in the States has mm -hmm. been one of, uh, of distancing from that. Mm, <clears throat> no, from no. From what the Orthodox, in, that Orthodox party in Israel had said. No, not distancing at all. In fact, we are coming on really strongly uh, because we have a stake in what goes on in Israel. We have a huge yeah. stake with what goes on in Israel. Um, what we have done um, as a reform and conservative. Now, you also have to understand that 80% of American Jews are either reform or conservative. Right, okay. We are the vast majority of Jews in this country. Um, and so what, what we have said is any, any of the Knesset ministers, which is the, or, the government in Israel, mm -hmm. who voted in favor of this will not be welcome as speakers in our, oh, in our organizations. Okay. Um, the other thing that we're doing there is an organization called the World Zionist Organization, which allocates funds in Israel. Um, every year, the Jewish Federation does a drive for money specifically for Israel, fundraising mm -hmm. drive, where they call every Jew in the city and, uh, right, for, to right. donate money to Israel. So the WZO is the organization which allocates where that money goes. And in the past, it's always gone to Orthodox institutions. We are in the process now of signing up uh, voters, um, registering voters, um, so that they will vote specifically for the reform slate on the WZO so that, more so that we have a say in where the money goes. Okay. 
So, so that's mm. that's how we're combating yeah. it. So it is engagement in terms of not, absolutely. We're not we're not letting this die yeah. because, as it stands now, the only place in the world where Reform and conservative Jews are not do not have legal rights is in the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. They have legal rights in every other country in the world except the state of <clears> Israel. <throat> so that's really problematic for us. Right, and remains to be seen what happens now by the government in terms mm -hmm. of this response that you're talking about. Right, right. Well, we're talking politics here. Mm -hmm. uh, is, you said there's probably more politics than religion. It's absolutely more politics than religion. And in the couple of minutes we have left, I, I think it's uh, fitting to have you give a little expression to, as, you've been call, as you have found yourself being a rabbi, uh -huh. and uh, being more into that uh, during this last year, uh -huh. what, uh, what is it that you're discovering that you could identify as at the very heart of your spiritual sharing with folks, both within your community and anyone who's uh -huh. looking in? It's a tough question. It's a, you know, Judaism by and large is a religion of doing and a religion of deed. Um, I don't, I don't have, take, I mean, not to say I take no issue with what people believe, um, but by and large, um, the Reform Judaism especially is a Judaism of individuality. We have, um, we're supposed to study and then make our own choices. I, as a rabbi, my job is to teach and to, to show people what all their choices are and mm -hmm. then let them choose. Okay. Um, so, you know, and I, I let them choose by example, certainly. You know, I have, I, I lead my own example, but even within our congregation, my practices and Rabbi Fulberg's practices are different. Um, services, I wear a yarmulke and he doesn't. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, mm -hmm. we each have our own, we've, and we've come, <clears throat> to our, we've come to those decisions in our own way, spiritually, in our own way, religiously. He, I grew up reform, and he grew up conservative, and, and yet, you know, this sure. is how we've ended up. Okay. So I, w I think that one of the things that's impressed me, too, is that the Jewish voice and witness in American society mm -hmm. is toward tolerance, mm -hmm. toward appreciation of differences rather than Absolutely. being threatened by that. Absolutely. And insofar as you practice that within your own community, mm -hmm. you model it for folks there to be continuing sure. it outside that community. Sure. I mean... It's hard, on some level, I mean, we do have our boundaries, absolutely, and mm -hmm. it's not that everything is acceptable. We do have boundaries of what's acceptable behavior and <clears throat> acceptable belief within the Jewish community and what isn't. Um, but yeah, but by and large, you know, we're an oppressed people. We know, we know what it feels like to be different and to be right. the other, right. and it's, it's real important to us that, that, um, that doors are open. Well, listen, real important to us that you've been with us today. Thank you. And I think you've opened some doors for folks as they've looked in to have a, a better appreciation of what, what you're about individually and what your community is. Thank you. And uh, we'd like to have you back some other time. Sure, sure. Yeah. And like to have you folks back next week on our next edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. I'm Richard Thompson for Austin Metropolitan Ministries, bidding you peace and shalom.